Today we're continuing our series on heights and diophantine geometry. And we're very happy to have Philip Habinger, who's talking on conjectures on unlikely intersections, what is known and what is open. And uh, Philip, is it all right if we record this talk? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Oh, wonderful. And you know, if you have a question during the talk, feel free to either put it in the chat or ask Philip directly. Okay, um, please go ahead. Okay, so first, of course, thank you to uh, Rachel and Drew for organizing this uh, Vantage seminar and for having me um, here speak. I will speak a bit about unlikely intersection. It's gonna be, I think, to a large part, a historic talk with um, a survey section. Um, I, I don't think I'll be able to cover everything so please bear with me. Um, so I'll start out over 20 years ago with one of the first papers I got to know about this subject, and uh, which was was quite influential at the time. So um, we have the, the three authors here. It's Enrico Bembieri, David Masser, and Umberto Zanye. And the paper was, um, was published in IMRN 1999. And <clears throat> it's maybe a bit hard to read the first three lines here, but I kind of paraphrased it by stating that the set of uh, non-zero non -zero complex number is not equal to one, such that uh, tau and one minus tau satisfy multiplicative relation. So this set is, uh, as you could read here in the first few lines, it's easy to see that this set is finite. And to see that, for example, you just take tau to be um, <clears throat> a root of unity. And then you can take, for example, R to be the order of tau and S to be zero. Um, you want tau to be not equal to one, just to make things well-defined. And then for each root of unity not equal to one, you get a point in this set. So this set is, is infinite. However, there is a feeling that it should be sparse, right? Because you start out with all complex numbers and then for each pair Rs of integers not equal to zero both, you cut out finitely many. And so you're taking a union over countably infinitely many sets of finite sets of complex numbers. So in a sense, there are infinitely many of these points tau, but they, they should be sparse. And we should think of them as sparse. And what that precisely means, I'll, I'll, I'll say that in, in a moment. And this is maybe the first instance of something that could looks like an unlikely intersection, but this is actually something that would could call L a just likely intersection. And it, what it means to be unlikely, we'll see that in just a moment. Okay, so let me move on. So this is more or less the same question now rephrased here again. So I'm interested in the tau such that uh, one and tau are multiplicatively dependent. And that's just formalized by this equation here with R and S non which is not equal, not equal to zero both. And so in, in other words, we can think of tau and one minus tau as being the x and y coordinate on some, some line, some algebraic curve in, um, in the plane. And it makes sense to talk about uh, the multiplicative group, which is just the non-zero algebraic numbers, because that comes equipped with uh, the structure of an algebraic group. And we're interested in if those cases were tau and one minus tau and non-zero. So this pair lies on a fixed curve um, but the points we're interested in lie um, in the zero set of, of an equation of this type. And you may recognize this as an algebraic subgroup of GM squared, right? It's defined by not necessarily a polynomial because R and S can be, um, could be negative, but um, because we removed zero, it's still a regular function on, uh, on the group. So the, these subgroups are algebraic. And in fact, you can show that any algebraic subgroup of dimension one in GM squared is defined by an equation like this where R and S are not both zero. So what we're kind of interested in is looking at points on some algebraic curve given by this line that also lies on a varying algebraic subgroup of GM squared. And so as you vary the algebraic subgroup, you give infinitely many of those, countably infinitely many, and they cut out some points on this curve and um, we get infinitely many points. But um, <clears throat> go back over 20 years ago, and there, there's an anecdote connected to this, actually, this precise question. I'm not exactly sure how much of it is true, uh, but apparently uh, Bombieri was able to prove 
in the matter of, of a few hours and um, that the height of these solutions is bounded from above. So um, if you've never heard about the height, I'll explain what that is in just a moment. So and apparently in this anecdote, uh, the proof was also written on a napkin, but I'm not sure if, if all of this is true, but it's, it makes for a nice story. So um, in a sense, it means that, well, we have infinitely many of these tau's, but they're all of, of bounded height. So there's a certain quantity B that's independent of R and S, such as the height of tau is at most B. And um, slightly later, uh, Paolo Cohen and Umberto Zagne showed that in fact, you can take log two and log two is best possible because uh, one possible solution is you can take tau equals two and uh, then r equals zero and s equals two will um, be a solution. And the height of tau of two is log two, as we'll see in just a moment. <clears throat> so this is a precursor of a more general result that they proved in their paper, the 1999 paper I just showed you before, the title page. So instead of taking x plus y equals one, parameterized by this tau here, we can take any algebraic curve defined over the field of algebraic numbers inside this uh, nth power of the multiplicative group. Then there's a, a hypothesis on the curve. Um, come to that in a moment. Curve is not supposed to be contained in the translate of a proper algebraic subgroup. Then the theorem says that the points on the curve that also lie in one of the infinitely many general algebraic subgroups that are not everything, we want to exclude, of course, the trivial algebraic subgroup, everything, those, those points have had bounded height, right? And so what does this hypothesis mean here, not contained in the translate of a proper algebraic subgroup? Um, that means that the curve is, for example, not given by an equation precisely of this quantity or where one is replaced, for example, by some non-zero algebraic number. So this is a, actually it turns out to be a necessary restriction. If you let that, if you drop that restriction, the theorem becomes becomes false. So we can think of this as a, an infinite union of finite sets. So in general, we have an infinite uh, set, but there, this is a set of bounded height. And now I should um, I should actually explain what the height is. I promised that before. So let's come to the heights. I'm just going to give you the height of an algebraic number. And if you're, if you're interested in the height of a point in um, n-dimensional affine space, you just take the maximum of the coordinates, for example. So if you start out with a rational number, it's uh, straightforward. Your rational number is always of the form p over q, where q uh, is positive, positive integer, and p and q are co-prime. Co so then they're unique. And um, the height is then just the logarithm of the maximum of numerator and denominator, max absolute value p and q. So it's always, uh, it's always a non-zero number. Non-negative number, it could be zero, but never negative. <clears throat> so that's for a rational number. Um, for an algebraic number, uh, more generally, you have to work with the minimal polynomial, and um, it makes sense to work with the integral minimal polynomial. So that would be an, an irreducible polynomial over the integers, um, where um, alpha is a root, and where um, just to make things unique, you can force the uh, you can ask for the leading term to be uh, Non, and, uh, to be positive. So the height then, um, by definition, is, it looks a bit complicated here, but what's happening here is we have the leading term of the minimal polynomial, and then um, that kind of comes from the finite contributions of the height, and then we have all roots of the, um, the, the minimal polynomials, so the, the Galois conjugates of alpha, and we just take the absolute value of those that lie outside the unit circle. So um, max one has Max 1z has the effect that we're taking the absolute value of z as a factor if z happens to lie outside the unit circle. And if it does not, then we just forget about it. And um, log is like a, as above. And an important feature here is that we're dividing by the degree. So in a sense, this is a normalized object. It's always non-negative because all the factors inside log are uh, at least one in absolute value. <clears throat> just some example, numerical examples, square root of 2024 has uh, height uh, squared, a log of square root of 2024. Things get a bit more tricky if uh, we're looking at more complicated algebraic numbers. And but this, you can show this. And you can have algebraic numbers of arbitrary small height. You just take um, the d root of two, and then the height will tend to zero. So whereas, for example, for rational numbers, if you bound the height, 
Um, you only have finitely many if you bound numerator into dom dominator of a rational number. You get finitely many rational numbers, but for algebraic numbers, this is no longer true, as you see here. If you bound the height of by, by log two, then you get infinitely many. But if you also bound the degree, so if you that has effect, of course, of bounding this d here, then this is a theorem often attributed to Northcott that this set set of algebraic numbers of bounded height and bounded degree is, is a finite set. Okay, so much for heights. And um, <clears throat> so what I was talking about before was, was essentially intersections that we would call, call um, just likely. So we had a curve intersected with an algebraic subgroup, which typically had dimension n minus one in the ambient space. And the intersection should be zero dimensional. What happens if you reduce the dimension of the algebraic subgroup by an additional counter? So you're intersecting now a fixed curve with a varying algebraic subgroup of dimension n minus two at most, then you would expect the intersection to be to be empty. Of course, that doesn't always happen. You could have some coincidence. The curve could meet the algebraic subgroup, even if the, the algebraic subgroup has very small dimension, even dimension zero. That can happen, but we would call these points unlikely because two lines in three-dimensional space are unlikely to intersect. So in, in the context of the very uh, basic curve I was talking about at the beginning, tau and one minus tau, what does it mean to be contained in an algebraic subgroup of dimension at most n minus two? Um, well, each algebraic subgroup of dimension n minus two is cut up by two multiplicative equations. And here, this is just represented by um, two multiplicative equations like this, where R and S, these exponent vectors are now uh, linearly independent. And so the theorem or the, the, the observation is that if you impose two multiplicative relations among these coordinates, you get a finite set. And the proof is in this case quite straightforward because if you have this property, then tau and one minus tau are automatically roots of unity because if you have two equations um, with linearly independent exponent vectors, you can combine them so that one of the equation is just like tau to the r and the other one is one minus tau to the s, so you can separate all of them. So these are roots of one. In particular, the complex plane they would be on the unit circle. So you just need to find out where do these two circles here um, with radius one meet. One circle is centered at the origin and the other is at circle with one. And there are two intersection points. That's That would be the sixth root of unity and its complex conjugate. And those are the two points in this set here, in this finite set. <clears throat> okay, so that's a very straightforward geometric kind of argument that would, um, would give finiteness if we have an unlikely intersection. <clears throat> and in fact, the paper I mentioned at the beginning also has a theorem for more general curves. So the curve I just presented had this, there was this new trick, but uh, this trick doesn't necessarily work for a general curve in um, GM to the N. So <clears throat> the theorem I prove, in fact, using the height bound that I presented before, is that if the curve um, satisfies the same hypothesis as before, and now we look at algebraic subgroups of dimension n minus two. So now we expect the intersection to be unlikely because we have something of dimension one and something of dimension at most n minus two. We don't expect them to meet. Now we have we still have an infinite unit in general, but this infinite unit doesn't accumulate, which it's a finite, it's a finite set. Right. And so the proof of this theorem in the original paper from 1999 uh, requires two steps. First of all, um, the height bound that I mentioned before, there's a height upper bound, because if we replace n minus two by n s minus one, we're making the set larger and we know have bounded height on the larger set. In addition to that, we also need uh, something I'm not going to go into, into too much detail. We need a height lower bound, which seems a bit counterintuitive, but um, in fact, there's a way to construct, um, if, you, if you imagine you have a lot of points here, there's a way to systematically construct points that have uh, exceedingly small height. And um, there's um, a whole array of, of results on, on small height um, in the context of what's sometimes called the Lamer conjecture. And in fact, um, the Bombieri masters, they, they, they used a higher dimensional version of the Bovolsky's theorem due to Amoroso and David also that appeared around uh, the same time. So uh, the finiteness results 
needs in addition to this height upper bound needs something um, coming from a lower bound. And this is a strong arithmetic result here. <clears throat> so if there are any questions, please feel free to um, write in the chat or just say something in your microphone. It sounds good. Okay, so let me let me go on. Okay, so this kind of started this paper um, <clears throat> started development. Um, it wasn't called unlikely intersections at the time, but um, well, I think Boris Silver may have uh, independently came to these um, kind of conjectures, and Richard Pink was motivated by combining some classical conjectures in the Eiffel-Tine geometry that I'll come to talk about. Uh, into a, a general framework that um, says that these kind of unlikely intersections should not happen unless there's some some um, some good reason for for why they should. Namely, so the ambient object you can think of again as this multiplicative group or power of it, or you can also think about something like an abelian variety or even a semi-abelian variety. Now the curve we had before, we'll just replace it by sub variety. <clears throat> And the sub-variety, we also have to impose a certain restriction on it, all right? We're, we're taking the intersection of the sub-variety with algebraic subgroups. So if the sub-variety itself happens to be an algebraic subgroup um, that appears in the union, we're not going to be able to say much. So we assume that, in a sense, that A is the smallest algebraic group that contains our X. So it's not contained, X is not contained in something, in a proper algebraic subgroup of, of A. And then kind of the conclusion is similar as before, but because now we're dealing with higher dimensional objects, X, we can't expect to find it in this result. We can only expect that a certain set is not so risky dense. So the points accumulate into something of positive co-dimension inside X. And what are we taking the union over? It's um, more or less the same thing as before, but now we have a, a, diff a slightly different dimension restriction. We're taking the union over uh, algebraic subgroups of our ambient group. So these would be the H's. And what does it mean to be unlikely? It means if X, if the point is contained in our X and in an algebraic subgroup, such that the dimension of X plus the dimension of H is less than the dimension of A, then we would expect them not to intersect. But again, it could happen. And um, this union kind of measures the, the, the degree into which this happens as we let, let H vary. And the conjecture, which is um, which I should stress because I think it's a seminar on, on open conjectures. This is an open conjecture in this gener generality. We'll come to some known results later on. <clears throat> but this is not so risky dense. And as I pointed out, um, the, before, there, there's a version for this for semi-abelian varieties, which is a generalization, a common generalization of an algebraic uh, a multiplicative uh, group and an abelian variety. Then there are versions for, for mixed Chamorro varieties, which is um, due to, to Richard Pink in his um, 2005 um, preprint. And there's even a more general version more recently due to Bruno Klinger on uh, kind of an unlikely intersections type result, uh, this conjecture for variations of mixed Hodge structures, which extends, I think, all known conjectures at the moment. <clears throat> all right. So um, <clears throat> I, I mentioned before that um, Richard Pink's motivation was to somehow generalize classical conjectures and, and theorems in diophantine geometry. And one of these classical theorems is the Monty Montfort um, conjecture, which uh, it's not, not conjecture and hasn't been on for over 40 years. And um, it was proved by um, Renaud, Michel Renaud in the 1980s. And there were a lot of different further proofs uh, by various people. So I'll um, formulate it for um, an abelian variety. And um, you can replace A also by the multiplicative group or some power of it, and it will stay a theorem as well. So we have an abelian variety in characteristic zero over, over the complex field. Uh, we have a sub-variety of A, and um, there's a kind of a non-degenerate hypothesis here. It's not supposed to be equal to an algebraic subgroup or at least in, in a reducible component of an algebraic subgroup. Then <clears throat> the question or the, the, the topic here would be finding points on X that are simultaneously torsion points of the algebraic group. And the conjecture concludes that uh, the, the torsion points that happen to lie on X is, is not a zero dense subset of X. Again, this is something contained in positive co-dimension because we're in higher dimension. We don't have in general finiteness results. <clears throat> 
So how does this follow from the, the result, from the conjecture of Zilberpink? We don't know the conjecture of Zilberpink, but we know it in this case, and this is how it will would follow if we had like the general version. So if we, we just assume for simplicity that uh, the hypothesis in Zilberpink, as I mentioned before, is also satisfied, the, the conjecture implies, if we knew it, that this intersection, this, U, this intersection here is not so risky dense. And remember, we're looking at the union over algebraic subgroups whose dimension plus the dimension of a, X is less than the ambient dimension. And well, the, the point is that torsion point always generates an algebraic subgroup of dimension zero. So if we make this union smaller, if we just replace here the dimension of H, we just we remove this condition, or we just look at the union over algebraic subgroups of dimension H, and um, the condition will be satisfied as soon as X is not everything. So we can do that in all the interesting cases. And then the conclusion is, is what we had up here in the theorem. So somehow quite straightforward, zero pink implies the money month for conjecture. Um, well, I had a small hypothesis here on X, um, but it's um, not too difficult to get rid of that in, by an induction on the dimension. <clears throat> so if X is not contained in a proper algebraic subgroup, then you could just replace a, a, a by something smaller until X satisfies the hypothesis. So that was the first classical kind of uh, result that uh, Pink was interested in. And the second one was the Mordell conjecture and its um, generalizations. So the Mordell conjecture is proved by Faultings also in the 1980s. And it's of a different flavor as Monty Montford um, at first glance. So now we have a smooth projective curve of genus at least two defined over a number of field K. Theorem says that uh, the key points of C is a finite set. So this is true in genus at least two. <clears throat> and um, this, Theorem would also follow from um, the general Zilber Pink conjecture, and I'll, I'll explain how that works in just a moment. So the, the point is we have to somehow find an algebraic group and connect this finiteness statement to um, an algebraic group. And it's quite, I guess, first guess would be Jacobian of the curve, which is an, an Nobelian variety. And um, we, we know its dimension. The dimension is exactly the genus of the curve. And if we assume that the, the curve is at least one k-rational point, we can always embed uh, the curve into its Jacobian. And um, so you can think of our original curve as being contained in some larger abelian variety, which has dimension g, which is greater than two, uh, greater or equal to two. So the curve somehow lies inside. So this is a, a simplifying assumption here. I'm just going to assume that the Jacobian has no non-trivial endomorphisms. We'll come to that in a moment. Um, <clears throat> now, okay, so we do need a, a result from, from, from the theory of abelian varieties, the Mordell A theorem, which tells us that um, the K points of the Jacobian, K, K is a number field, remember, is a finely generated abelian group, right? So this is a, a result. Um, 20th century result, classical result. And so it kind of reduces this, proving this theorem to proving that if I forget about that where I'm interested in rational points of the curve, I'm just looking at algebraic points on the curve and I want to find those points on the curve contained in a finitely generated you know, algebraic group. I want to show that this intersection is finite. So it kind of feels like, um, kind of feels like um, an unlikely intersection kind of result. We have a curve and we have this kind of discrete like subgroup. But remember that for the Zilber Pink conjecture, at least formally, we need to work with algebraic subgroups. And, and this subgroup here is it's finitely generated. It's only going to be algebraic if, if it's finite. So we have to do an additional step. And in fact, um, it was a bit of a red herring to take the Jacobian. We have to take something slightly different than the Jacobian to, to actually apply the, the conjecture to reduce to, to deduce Faulting's theorem. So what do we do? Um, well, remember, Model A tells us that this group is finitely generated. Um, we, 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 we take some independent uh, collection of points where R is just the, the, the rank of the group. So you don't have to be a basis, but just independent. And um, the simplifying assumption I did on the last slide told us that the Jacobian doesn't have any non-trivial endomorphism. And <clears throat> that implies that this tuple here of points will be a point in the Jacobian to the R 
that is not contained in a proper algebraic subgroup. So what we're doing now is we're kind of making the ambient abelian variety a lot larger, replacing the Jacobian by its R plus first power and replacing the curve by the, the curve. And then we're adding a lot of torsion, uh, sorry, a lot of constant points. So this curve here is contained in some larger abelian variety, but a lot of the points are, are constant. So it doesn't look like we're doing much, but this is actually a quite important step. And then using, using this um, observation, you can show that this curve C tilde, this augmented curve, is not contained in the proper algebraic subgroup of, of the new abelian variety. Otherwise, this point here would also be, which was excluded. Now, if you have any points, any k-rational point on the curve, you can um, write some multiple of this point um, in terms of the, these um, independent points we started out with. So we can write a linear equation among the points. And then now the, the group action of Jacobian comes into play. And now we also have the algebraic group, the subgroup because the algebraic subgroup that the, the, that's going to be connected to our point is the one defined by this linear relation here. So now it's an algebraic subgroup of the R plus first power of the Jacobian. That's the thing that's varying. The varying properties are these A's and A naught and, and the point P. So I have the same thing copied again here. So now to apply still the pink, if we knew this conjecture, we have to say something about, we have to know that it's actually an unlikely intersection. So we have to do some dimension calculations and the, well, the dimension of C is one, it's a curve, right? The dimension of the Jacobian is G. So the dimension of this R plus first power is G times R plus one. And the dimension of the algebraic subgroup cut up by this linear equation here is it's, it's in the group law, but with the dimension of the ambient group minus G. And because we're imposing somehow one condition, you can also think of this algebraic subgroup H as a kernel of, um, a homomorphism of algebraic groups defined here with target Jacobian. And then there's a dimension um, theorem that tells you that the dimension of H has to be G times R. And now, <clears throat> well, you compare the dimension of C plus the dimension of H is less than the ambient dimension. We, at one point, we have to need that, we have to apply, use that the genus is at least two, otherwise the theorem is, is not right. And the genus at least two condition implies that this augmented point is actually an unlikely intersection. And so the points P here have to be in a finite set because well, these, these coordinates P1 to PR are actually fixed. So that's how to re reduce um, faulting theorem to, to an open conjecture. And um, I did this simplifying assumption on the endomorphism ring of the um, Jacobian, but that's something that can get, one can get rid of um, without much additional work. All right. So let me move on to what is actually known about this conjecture in uh, various contexts. So uh, I mentioned the theorem before. Um, <clears throat> this is the same theorem I stated before. Um, <clears throat> the finiteness result by Bombieri and Massuzani in 1999. So again, the proof uses boundedness of height. And um, <clears throat> now there's a small caveat I want to highlight again. So the hypothesis is the same as before. It's not contained in any translative algebra, proper algebraic subgroup of the, cur of the ambient group. Um, but if I go back for a moment, uh, I know it's not good to do this, but the algebraic subgroup here, uh, the, sorry, the curve here, I defined here. Sorry, um, right. Philip, uh, yes? I don't mean to interrupt you here, but there is a, a question in the chat. I don't know if you've had a chance to, whether you've- uh, Ah, yeah, I see it. Yeah, okay. So the question is why, um, does the intersection between um, here um, being non zero risky dense imply finiteness? So, in a sense, the, the, the point here, we can think of it as um, being contained in now in the union of sets of this kind, where H satisfies the dimension hypothesis. And um, what we can think of is that the k rational points of the augmented curve are contained in this union. And so this union here is not so risky dense in the augmented curve because the augmented curve is dimension one, be not dense means that it's a finite set. I hope that helps. Great, thanks. Okay. So while I'm here, yeah, so the curve here, that actually led to 
Faulting theorem is a curve that's contained in the translate of a proper algebraic subgroup because some of the coordinates are fixed. And the hypothesis here rules out exactly these cases. So in, if you remember Zilber Pink, the conjecture, um, the conjecture had um, this word translate was not there. It seems like a subtle difference, but um, removing these cases kind of rules out a lot of applications. So Zilber Pink should hold under the weaker hypothesis that where the word translate is, is, is missing. The difficulty is that this theorem that the boundness of height is no longer true under this um, weaker hypothesis if we uh, let the dimension of h uh, go to n minus one in the, in the likely. So there, there were some new, uh, some new methods were, were, were required. And um, that was then quite some years later in 2008, this was uh, improved by Guillaume Morin and using um, important work of Guy Raymond. And he was able to show the Zilber Pink conjecture for curves in the multiplicative group when everything is defined over the field of algebraic numbers, right? And then around the same time, um, Bombier and Masser and Zamia were able to generalize that to curves over the field of complex numbers. So they still needed the, these height lower bounds that I mentioned before. And um, they also needed a height upper bound, but now under this weaker hypothesis on the curve, that kind of allows all these interesting examples that are, appear naturally in the context of the Mordell conjecture. <clears throat> so um, then going from Q bar to C, uh, that was that was done by Bombieri Mastrizani, that was via specialization result. Okay, so this kind of this kind of result already is quite close to um, the Mordal conjecture. We're dealing with um, know, algebraic torus. If we had something similar for abelian varieties, we would get somehow um, something that implies the Mordal conjecture. So what about abelian varieties, one could ask? And what happens if we replace C by something of higher dimension? What do we know then? <clears throat> so regarding the height bound, this was, uh, oh, I forgot to put a year here. So I think this was around 2007, 2008. I'll put that in the final slides. So um, <clears throat> now we're in the context of an abelian variety. Um, there's also a concept of height here if we have a polarization. Um, and Rameau proved that under the good hypothesis, so um, the, the weaker hypothesis, curve is not contained in a proper algebraic subgroup A, then um, the height is bounded from above on the set of points of unlikely intersection. Now we're taking the union of algebraic subgroups of A. Right? So this is a set of bounded height. Um, and as we remember before, once you have boundedness of height and you have um, these, these lower bounds, then you can hope for a finite result. The difficulty in the Belling case is that these lower bounds for heights are extremely delicate and they actually even remain open in general. And, and they're, they're known for, in some classes, for, for uh, Abelian varieties with complex multiplication. That's a result of Carrizosa and um, in earlier work of um, Katazzi. And um, in the case of a power of an elliptic curve, this goes back to work of Galatou and then applied by, um, by Viada. So for some classes of abelian varieties, we could actually get um, uh, silver pin conjecture, but the arithmetic of the abelian variety played a big, big role in connection with these height lower bounds. So they're very, they're quite delicate and they're still open in, 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 in complete generality. So um, normally we would be stuck at this point until today, today but then um, around 2011, this new strategy uh, due to uh, Pila and Zanya was introduced. So I picture here of uh, actually Pila and Wilkie. Um, and Pila and Zanya, they, um, they used um, methods from, from mo model theory, luminal ge geometry, and uh, the Pila-Wilkie counting theorem to, to really attack problems in, in diaphragm time geometry. And so the first success was uh, the Manu Montfort conjecture and new proof of it. Um, <clears throat> So by Pila and Zanya using this counting theorem. And um, <clears throat> later on, Pila gave, uh, for the first time, unconditional cases, new unconditional cases of the Andriar conjecture in a, a power of, of modular curves. And there was a rapid series of developments over the next 10 years, 
And uh, the culmination was in the proof of the Andreo conjecture in full generality. And there were a lot of intermediate steps um, and um, different pieces of the puzzle had to come together. I guess maybe this would be a topic for a, a, a talk on its own, but I just uh, listed uh, many of the people involved in this uh, pretty rapid development over 10 years, where this strategy um, using ideas from minimal geometry really made a big, had a big impact on, on, on Android. So, and in, in, in fact, the strategy is also applicable to sort of think type questions. And that allowed um, Jonathan and myself to um, to prove Zilberping for curves uh, in an abelian variety defined over Q bar. So remember we had the height bound um, due to the work of Raymond, um, but was what was missing was the height, uh, the height upper bound, what was missing was the height lower bound, and those are still missing today, but we were able to use um, somehow older work of, of David Master on, on height lower bounds that are not conjecturally almost best possible, but they were good enough to get this um, uh, this P lasagna strategy working. So uh, the, the strategy is in a sense robust and allows you to work with um, results or that, that are not um, essentially best possible and still get um, strong you know, strong finiteness results. So that was for uh, for the Bellion variety case. And then there was also uh, a more recent work by, by uh, Fabrizio Barreo, he's pictured here, um, Lars Kühne and Harry Schmidt in 2021, where they did the semi abelian case. So the, the case of um, the multiplicative group was already done by uh, Morin, and the semi abelian case kind of combines all of these. Right. So what's still remained open is, is uh, well, we had Q bar here. Um, you need Q bar to, to deal with, to define, well, that's one way to, to introduce heights is on, on Q bar, um, field, uh, field of algebraic numbers. And a lot of the techniques were, were uh, required Q bar. Uh, on the other hand, at least in the multiplicative case, Bombieri, Master, Zania had a reduction to, from, from C the complex field to Q bar. And um, working that out in the abelian case, turned out to be quite difficult because, well, if, if you have an abelian variety defined over C, you can think of it as the defined, being defined over a finally generated extension of Q, but then you have to think of the abelian variety essentially as a family of abelian varieties. And um, that introduces a lot of additional difficulties. And they were finally solved um, thanks to the work of um, Xiang Gao, who um, proved um, what's known as the act general theorem for the universal family of abelian varieties. And that alerted them to, to results by, um, by Fabrizio, uh, Fabrizio Barrio was pictured here, and, and Gabriel Dill, who I think, uh, drew himself here. And they were able to prove Zilber Pink for um, all curves over C defined in all abelian varieties defined into the complex field. So the, under the good, the weak hypothesis on the curve, and now we have a purely somehow geometric statement on, on complex points, um, and, but the proof is, is highly uh, arithmetic. It goes through, um, it contains as a subcase the uh, the Mordell conjecture. It does not give a new proof of the Mordell conjecture, but uh, it reduces to that case. <clears throat> All right. So, and what about higher dimensional subvarieties? So, the conjecture I already wrote down. So, now we have instead of curve, we have X inside some A. And um, so, this case is in, in general, it's still open even for the multiplicative group. And uh, the difficulty start out with, with getting the height upper bound. So, um, so an early concept of trying to study these um, higher dimensional cases um, was, was introduced by um, Bombieri, Masser, and Zanya in the 2007 paper. And um, they looked at points on X on, on your test variety, such that uh, the point lies in, um, in a translate of an abelian subvariety whose intersection with X is somehow too large. Again, we have this somehow um, this uh, critical dimension here, and the dimension of the intersection at the point P is is greater than this. So this is somehow it's kind of an unlikely intersection, but now um, the point P is arbitrary, so it's it's more of a geometric condition here, and instead of an arithmetic one because um, P doesn't have to be, for example, a torsion point. So points P where where there exists an abelian subvariety with this property here called anomalous. Right? And um, <clears throat> the anomalous points are somehow those that are harder to work with from a certain point of view. And in some simple cases, it's quite easy to, 
um, to, to describe the, the anomalous locus or its complement, if, for example, if X is a curve, uh, or if, if X is itself contained in the translate of a proper algebraic subgroup, um, then essentially it's um, the, the anomalous locus will be everything or the complement would be empty, whatever you prefer. <clears throat> And if X is a curve, then the anomalous locus or uh, XOA, the complement is, is the empty set if and only if uh, the curve is contained in, a, in the translate of a proper uh, abelian subvariety of A. So in a sense, um, <clears throat> this XOA is, is the complement of the anomalous points. We think of the points that we can, we can deal with. Uh, there is a geometric way to describe them using um, our abelian variety B, subvariety B, um, will induce like a map from A into the quotient, A mod B. And the anomalous points are those points where the fiber of this, um, um, this reduction map here restricted to X, where the fiber is too large locally. Too large just means that it's later, greater than this maximum here. So it's kind of imposing one of infinitely many uh, conditions on, on the point. And a key step in the theorem that I, I, I cited up here is that is that um, that there are actually only finitely many bees to work uh, to, 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 to worry about? So what does the theorem say? So the theorem says that the anomalous locus or the complement is the risky open in X. So and this is kind of surprising because yeah, there are infinitely many abelian varieties, subvarieties B to, to worry about, but uh, the condition is somehow cut out by maximally many uh, by finitely maximal um, bees in a certain sense. And <clears throat> It also kind of tells you what happens when is the anomalous locus empty. And I think um, this is an if and only if here even. So the anomalous locus, the XOA is empty if and only if um, there's a way to project down our variety X in such a way that the projection, the dimension of the projection is less than um, what um, you would, less than the, the trivial upper bound. So the trivial upper bound is the dimension of X or uh, the dimension of the, the target. And if you're less than the trivial upper bound, then XOA has to be, has to be uh, empty. So for example, this happens quite naturally. If you take, for example, your, your X to be a surface equal to a curve cross itself inside an abelian variety cross itself, and you project down onto one of the factors of the abelian variety, um, the image of the surface will be a curve. So you've dropped down a dimension and um, this XOA will be empty. So all points are anomalous in this, in this setting here. <clears throat> and why are these anomalous points uh, interesting? Well, if, um, if you want to prove a, a boundness of height result um, uh, the chest, in the just likely case, then, um, well, the, the height is bounded from above. So what does the theorem here say? If we have um, um, our subvariety X of an abelian variety. And now uh, we remove the anomalous points. So we get something that's a risky open, but could be empty. And we look at the points here in XOA that meets an algebraic subgroup whose dimension is um, somehow just likely um, with regards to X. And this will the set will be a set of bounded, a bounded height, bounded from above. And then <clears throat> um, Jonathan Peel and I were able to use the boundness of height um, to show, so we're putting subject to a condition on the on X away. So in a sense, this means that not all points are anomalous. There's at least one non-anomalous point, and that means there's a risky open set, uh, dense set of points is not anomalous. And then we get on the complement, uh, we get we get uh, um, the silver pink kind of statement for that. Unfortunately, this does not give Zilber pink for the surface C cross C, um, because in that case, XOA is, is just the empty set, right? And uh, the first part of the theorem is trivial, we get a, an upper bound on the empty set. So that's not helpful. So this is a case where, um, where the conjecture and the surface case is, uh, is open. There are some uh, results in, in higher co-dimension. Um, I'm, as I said at the beginning, I think not, not citing everything. Some work, um, even going back to Bombieri and Zani in the 90s, 90s by, by Gabriel Dill in the high co-dimension case where you can do th some things, but so, somehow in these intermediate dimensions when the dimension of the, the test variety is somehow bigger than one and, and the co-dimension is also bigger than two, then that's when the, um, 
the, the conjecture becomes uh, becomes open. <clears throat> right. So the first, um, right. So th th this idea of using Pila Zanya strategy to prove Zilber Pink results was also then employed by, by Laura Capuano in her thesis, and she was working in the uh, GM to the N case. Um, <clears throat> Entirely picture there. All right. So maybe in the last few minutes, I want to say something else about the modular side. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, when Pink formulated this conjecture, um, he had the Andre Ward conjecture in, in mind also. Um, and this is a conjecture on Shimura varieties. And the, um, the Zilber Pink conjecture has a very general for formulation for mixed Shimura varieties. I'll just go into two special cases. And one of them is somehow the, the a pure case. So, um, and we'll look at um, the modular curve Y1, which is just a fancy way of saying the affine line. And um, we think of a point on the affine line, a complex point on the affine line as being um, the J invariant of an elliptic curve. And um, the isomorphism classes of an elliptic curve um, so, so an elliptic curve over C is determined up to isomorphism by its J invariant. So we can think of the, the field of complex numbers as being the set of isomorphism classes and elliptic curves over, over C. <clears throat> and there's a there's a modular interpretation to all this. And so we, we kind of replace the, the algebraic group, um, the abelian variety or the multiplicative group, we replace it by, for example, powers of this modular curve A1. So we're essentially just in a fine end space. So, but we also have to say what what are the kind of the the, the sub varieties that will intersect with. So it's kind of like a group structure here, the additive group. But we're not going to work with that. We're going to work with something that comes from the modular interpretation, um, uh, connecting the J invariant to the elliptic curve. So we want to single out sub varieties of this power that kind of play the role of the algebraic subgroups, and um, <clears throat> they're they're called special sub varieties, um, and a special sub variety is essentially split up up to permuting coordinates, essentially split up into a product of things. And there could be certain factors where that are just constant. So we have certain coordinates are constant, and we impose that these constants are J invariants of elliptic curves with complex multiplication. And then we have some non-constant coordinates, and these are all these are H, each S I here is a curve. And they are cut up by these classical modular polynomials. And so each SI is itself an algebraic curve cut up by modular polynomials. And a, a classical modular polynomial, um, it depends on two variables. And a point um, is a zero if and only if the two elliptic curves uh, attached to J1 and J2 are, um, are isogenous. And there is a cyclic, an isogeny, isogeny between them that's uh, cyclic with cyclic kernel of, of Order n. So you see this n here kind of parametrizes these polynomials. So for each natural number n, there is one. So they're um, quite complicated to write down in general. And um, but they're all polynomials, they have integer coefficients and they are uh, irreducible as, as such. <clears throat> so that's how to that's those are the special sub varieties. And um, a quite recent result due to um, Martin um, uh, Chris Daw and Martin Ort from um, just a few years ago, if if we take a curve um, in in uh, y one to the n defined over q bar, <clears throat> probably not necessary here. Um, but so we assume that the the natural hypothesis um, in silver pink, so the curve is not supposed to be contained in a proper special sub variety, and then there's a second hypothesis that um, that the curve meets the the point at infinity um, in in a Zariski closure. Then the set of points on the curve um, that are also contained in a, in a special sub variety of, of dimension at most n minus two is finite. So you can think of this as points on the curve and certain point pairs of coordinates are linked by uh, isogenies. For example, the first and the second coordinate, the second and the third are linked by an isogeny. And this is a fine result. And what's, um, what's striking about, about this result is that, well, first of all, boundedness of height, as we saw, um, where n minus two is replaced by n minus one is, is false in this modular setting. And um, a lot of things are, are quite are quite different. And, uh, and so an important tool that they, 
they introduced here is, is using G functions um, under Eve Andre's theory of G functions. So they were not able to achieve boundedness of height, which is actually false, but um, something like a weak height bound. And, and that relied on this, um, this hypothesis and a certain reduction property as the curve kind of moves towards the boundary of, of, of this modulized space. And I also brought up the word mixed. So, um, so um, what, is, what does mixed mean? Well, pure means what we had before, a moduli problem. And mixed is something when you have um, like a, a family of, of uh, Bellian varieties elliptic curves. And so you have a, a pure part like this modular curve Y2. And on top of it, we have a family of elliptic curves. And Y2 just means that we're not only looking at elliptic curve, but we're also looking at uh, three marked points of order two. So these, that would be one, a zero, one, and lambda. So you can think of uh, Y2 uh, being this base curve here. And on top of each point, we have an elliptic curve. And the colors vary because the isomorphism classes varies. And there's some holes in the bottom because we are missing zero, one, infinity. So inside this, this elliptic surface, um, um, we, have, uh, we can look at unlikely intersection type problems. So what happens in more general, if we have an, a, a family of abelian varieties, and what happens if we, we, we look at points that are torsion on, on this family? So they, they will be contained in the kernel of multiplication by some integer. And when does this kernel intersect um, x in an unlikely fashion? Well, if you're in a fixed abelian variety, the kernel is just zero dimensional. But if we're in a family of abelian varieties, like here, the kernel will have the same dimension as the dimension of the base. And the intersection will be unlikely if and only if the dimension of x is less than the relative dimension of this family of abelian varieties. So here, the relative dimension would be one because we're looking at a family of elliptic curves. So kind of interested in what happens with the intersection of x with um, the, the set of torsion points. Now, it's no longer a subgroup because we can't add points in different fibers. And um, the first results towards this direction, this kind of relative money Montfort result were, were due to Masar and Zani around 2008. And this was also at the start where, where this, um, this, this counting strategy really started off. So they were able to show that um, both if we, we, long series of papers also part in collaboration with Pietro Cavaglia, if we start out with a curve in some family of abelian varieties, and there's a condition on the curve that somehow means it's in general position, which is also the, the natural condition here. Then as soon as the intersections, as the intersections are unlikely with torsion, so for the ambient, uh, the relative dimension is at least two, then there are only finally any points um, on the curve that are torsion, the respective fiber. Right. So was a series of important papers. Um, and in fact, there are some explicit results here too. This is a result by Michael Stoll, which um, if you look at just the, this, this elliptic Legendre family, if you look at points where the X coordinate is fixed to be two and the Y coordinate is fixed to be three, you let lambda vary, why not both of them are simultaneously torsion? Um, the Masuizani result tells you finally often, in fact, Stoll was able to show that in this case, there are actually no lambda with this property. So no points are finally off, are, are simultaneously torsion. Right. So in the um, there was some also some recent developments and um, well so this was uh, last year a paper by uh, Pietro Cavaglia, Jacob Zimmerman, Bertazzani, where they were able to resolve um, my Montfort or the relative money Montfort conjecture um, for for surfaces so no longer for curves defined over C so this required um, also a specialization argument going from Q bar to C. And then uh, Ziang Gao and myself, also last year, we showed it for uh, sub-varieties of, uh, of any dimension in an abelian scheme. So the hypothesis, um, somehow the non-degenerate hypothesis is essentially written down here. Um, well, we, we have to somehow look at the, um, the multiples of, of X and the, the union has to be Zariski dense in, in A. There's a way to test this on the generic fiber. They, and then if the, the dimension condition is met, so um, the dimension of X is um, strictly less than uh, the genus, uh, the, the relative um, dimension, then we have a non-Sirisky denseness. Okay. So I guess because it's a, 
um, a seminar on open injectors and questions, let me just state two problems. One of them um, posed by Aaron Levin, and um, this is related to silver pink for curves, uh, for surface, sorry, but it involves two curves. So one is given a point on the first curve, one is some power of this point uh, contained on the second curve. Um, <clears throat> So of course, curves have to be in general position somehow, and um, the dimension of the ambient space has, has to be large enough. And um, except in some natural exceptional cases, we expect this set here to be fine as well. This is this is open in general, and also more vague questions. So what can we say about uniform results towards silver pink? And what can we say about effective results towards built silver pink? There's some. There's some evidence that um, uh, that this can be proved and hold by various people, Slanian, Yuli Bilu, Guy Fowler, Lars Kühler, Kühne, Florian Luca, and Emmanuel Troll, and, and others. Um, maybe that's topic for another talk. So thanks for your attention.